So uh, last night when I was accepting the award, I talked about the importance of theory um, that uh, William James uh, espoused and how pleased I am to receive an award in his name uh, for that reason and also because my professional life began in William James Hall. So today I want to talk about this neoconstructivist approach uh, to cognitive development. Um, here's a book called Neoconstructivism that was edited by Scott Johnson, and I've also written about this theme in Child Development Perspectives. But I first want to sketch, for those of you who uh, know about cognitive development primarily from teaching introductory psychology, uh, some of the contemporary scene in cognitive development. Because intro psych books routinely say, you know, there was Piaget and there's a lot of Piaget and there's all these stages about Piaget and all these names associated with Piaget. Then they kind of say, well, there's some criticisms and there's information processing and oh, there's Vygotsky and besides babies are smarter than Piaget thought. But that's very much a sideline. And what isn't presented in terms of the theme of how smart babies are is nativism. And nativism, I really think, has become the predominant theoretical approach uh, among sort of professionals to cognitive development. And I think that pendulum has gone too far and that it's time to swing it back and that it is swinging back to something that I would call neoconstructivism, although other people use other terms. I think it's an umbrella term that embraces several alternatives. And at the end, I'll talk about some of the sort of family disagreements within this umbrella term of neoconstructivism. So, Today I want to talk about three themes, and the, the first one is the one that I'm going to develop in most depth. So I want to address the idea that infants are smarter than you think. I think they're smarter than you think if you think they don't know anything, uh, if you think that they're a tabula rasa, which is usually the straw person that people put up. But I don't think they're as smart as some people think they are. I think they are, in some respects, really not so smart, and that there's a lot of change that occurs during development, and that our task is indeed to embrace this change and to think about what creates this change. That might seem obvious to many of you who know babies, and yet it is actually a somewhat heretical viewpoint in a lot of infant psychology. So I want to illustrate this with reference to mental rotation, which is something that I and my colleagues have done quite a lot of research on, and which is actually not one of the things that's traditionally part of the nativist repertoire, but it's something that I know a lot about. So that's what I'm going to develop in most depth. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the other, what I think of as the second pillar of nativism, which is the idea that the mind is modular, um, that it's you know, divided into these very separate territories. Um, and I'll do that much more briefly. I've spent a lot of time talking about the debate about the geometric module, and I don't want to do that in too much depth, although I'll allude to it. And then at the end, I want to talk about neoconstructivism and what I think the sort of key tenets are and what some of the family disagreements are. So let's plunge into infants are smarter than you think, but how smart are they really? Um, and you must admit that infant, he doesn't look too not smart, but he's yawning and he possibly looks also not so smart. <laughs> that was why I picked that picture. Okay, so mental rotation is one of the oldest paradigms in modern cognitive psychology. Um, even those of you who don't do cognitive psychology have probably seen these Shepard Metzler block figures. The question is whether they're the same or different. You mentally imagine one swinging and you can tell that it's the same. It takes you a certain amount of time to do that, which is measured in milliseconds. How far you have to swing it uh, results in this linear function where the further you have to swing, the longer it takes. Um, beautifully fit, you can tell how old that figure is by uh, the kind of figure it is, sort of fuzzy and obviously taken from a very much older publication. Now, not so long after 1971, when this Shepard Metzler paper appeared, um, as part of what was then, uh, not infants are smarter than you think, but 
preschoolers are smarter than you think because that's where this all started. Um, a woman called Gloria Marmer did a similar kind of experiment with ice cream cones that had bites taken out of them or teddy bears that had one arm raised or the other arm raised. And the task was to decide whether the ice cream cones or the teddy bears were the same or different. And uh, what you can see at the bottom uh, is that adults are very fast. You can see the linear trend, but it's kind of squished because they're so fast they're way at the bottom of that graph. Then you can see data for five-year-olds who are quite a lot slower and their linearity is easier to see. And then you can see data for four-year-olds who are a lot slower and linear, but look at those error bars. So this was widely taken as evidence for preschoolers being able to do mental rotation. Um, and yet, shortly after this, a woman called Ann Dean, who's more or less lost to the myths of history, published some critiques of this. And uh, amongst them is the critique that even these four-year-olds, the ones who are very slow and very noisy, are pre-selected. These are the four-year-olds who can do anything in this paradigm. And many other four-year-olds were kicked out. So four-year-olds, maybe not so much. 20 years later, David Estes found more or less the same thing with a very similar kind of stimulus. What you can see is the three bars on the left are people who are non-rotators, and look how high the four-year-olds are. You can ignore the distinctions within those bars. Those are different kinds of non-rotators. Most of David Estes four-year-olds are non-rotators. With the three bars on the right, you can see the four-year-olds, the six-year-olds, and the adults. Not very many four-year-olds are rotators. So this is a pretty consistent finding. Furthermore, another finding, even more recent, which comes from Andrea Frick, uh, who did this work in Switzerland and later came to be a Silk postdoc. Um, this is showing, now you're looking at zero degrees is in the middle, so you want to see a V shape for the linear reaction time or the linear error rates. Um, it's there for the adults, although again, you can't see it because they're way at the bottom, and the 11-year-olds and then moving up the eight-year-olds, and again, the five-year-olds, are really slow, really variable. You can see the linear trends, but there's also an additional finding, which is going to be an important aspect of this um, discussion, which is that the other thing Frick et al. did was to have the subjects in the experiment do a, a, a motor task at the same time. They had to turn a wheel under the table, either clockwise or counterclockwise. And sometimes clockwise would be the way you wanted to rotate the stimulus to see if it fit. Sometimes that would go against the way you wanted to rotate it. And the bars show how interfering that motor task was. The adults and the 11-year-olds are actually not affected by that. Now, sometimes when you do imaging studies, fMRI, you can get motor cortex to light up when adults are doing Shepard-Metzler tasks, but not always. So adults kind of, sort of, sometimes use motor imaging to do this, but they don't have to. But look at the 8-year-olds and even more the 5-year-olds. So there's a very large importance of motoric stuff to the kids, and that indicates that they're doing something a little differently. But meanwhile, the infants are smarter than you think theme was going great guns. So I want to tell you about some studies that showed that. These are studies that use looking time as the dependent variable. And even those of you who don't do infant research know that that is the way that we generally asked babies whether or not they know something. So Sue Hespis and Philippe Rashaw, I think, started this with um, uh, an event showing babies an event where a particular stimulus looks a little like some sort of weird tool is turning as it falls behind an occluder. And then it is removed from behind the occluder, either in how it would have following that kind of arc or progression would be expected to, the orientation it would be expected to be in, or in like, oh, suddenly it went like that, like, how come? And indeed, they looked more at the one that it shouldn't be. 
Similarly, and more recently, using something like Shepard Metzler block figures and younger babies, three to, uh, this is five month olds, Scott Johnson, uh, these are colored blocks, but he showed the blocks oscillating, oscillating, this is habituation, then he shows the block or the mirror image block in an orientation that was not shown in habituation. And the question is whether the babies look more when it's the mirror image block, and they do. And simultaneously, cheek by jowl in psychological science, Paul Quinn and Lynn Libin, in a very different kind of paradigm, showed pairs of ones. Of course, babies don't know ones. Um, and uh, they're actually not shown from the top down. They're just shown in various kinds of pairs. And then a pair is shown that was not shown before that either is or is not a pair of mirror images. And these three to four month olds look longer when it's not mirror images. So although Scott Johnson is the author of neoconstructivism, but here he's taking a radical babies are smarter than you think kind of point, and Paul Quinn is not really a nativist either, and he's taking the same perspective, and that shows how pervasive these kinds of conclusions are in infant development right now. Both of these studies, by the way, also showed sex differences favoring male infants, which gives rise to a whole other talk that I won't have time to give about sex differences and whether they are there and why they're there and this kind of thing. But, okay, let's look, let's pause, let's review. We have all these different stimuli and really different results. Remember, four-year-olds are flaky, but babies as young as three months are really, really smart. And it doesn't seem to be linked to the stimuli because the stimuli really vary a lot. So I think there are two possibilities. One is that at, at, at this point, but then I'm gonna rule out the first one. So the first one is that the babies are just able to succeed because they're shown a lot of movement. All they have to do is interpolate or extrapolate, but they've shown many, many orientations. They just have to do a little interpolation. Um, whereas the adults just see a static presentation. Okay, there it is. You never see it in any other orientation, like is it right or is it wrong? So it may require more mental resources. I think that's not it, at least from six months on up. I'm not sure about under six months. Um, but the other thing is that the dependent variable for the babies is looking time. And the dependent variable for four on up is an explicit response. Which is it? Commit. That one, that one, say, point, do something. It's one or the other. That's really different. With looking time, it's just like, oh, I look a lot, I look a little less, but not my, oh, I look a little more. I mean, that is not a commitment. And that's what I think is really going on. Okay, so here are the new studies done by Andrea Frick and Venke Muring, both of whom postdoc with me, but also did some work in Switzerland before they joined me, um, done with infants and also done with preschoolers. So the first study, which appeared just last year, Maring and Frick in Child Development, um, used violation of expectation, uh, so it's not habituation. So there's these uh, blue P or Q, and depending on, uh, so the P on the other side has that incredible yellow and red kind of bullseye thing, and the Q on its either side has that same kind of thing. If you're a baby in this experiment, you only see the P or you only see the Q. You do not see it in multiple orientations. It just goes straight up and down behind the occluder. And then it comes out upside down or in some other orientation, either in, uh, it, it could be that, or it really couldn't be that, because on the other side is that incredible, you know, bullseye kind of thing. Now, how do they know that on the other side there's that incredible bullseye thing? Well, one of two ways. Either they get to manually explore it before the experiment. So they're handed it. You can see that baby doing an awkward left-handed swipe at it, you know, but he's old enough to somehow get hold of it and he'll explore it looking at both sides. Or observation. You see the baby at the right, there's a mirror there going for it with two hands, but front can't get it. And behind that glass wall, the experimenter shows it on both sides. So you get to see it, but you don't get to touch it. You don't get to actively interact with it. And what they found was that if you're a six month old and you got to handle it, you do look more at the impossible, but if you did not get to handle it, if you only observed it, you don't. 
So that shows the importance. This is still the dependent variable's looking time, but remember it can't be interpolation or extrapolation, any of that. And it also shows the importance of manual exploration. If you're a 10 month old, you can just be shown it. So you have more time interacting with objects you can learn from observation. Um, and with the 10 month olds though, it's linked to your locomotor experience. So some babies are crawling, that helps a little bit. Remember when you crawl, you have to use your hands. So you can't really use your hands to explore things so well when you crawl. Upright walking is the ticket. Remember the importance of upright walking for humans frees up your hands, you can interact with things. So once the babies who are 10 are able to walk, which only some of them are, they're the ones who are really carrying the effect because they have enough experience with manual exploration that they can get it from just observation. Now, um, Andrea did a first postdoc at UC Santa Cruz with Su Hua Wang where uh, she did something, this is now with kids who quite a lot older, they're 13 to 14, uh, 16 months, but it's really very similar and it shows how you can ratchet up the age range with different stimuli. So you're looking at this kind of duck thing on a lazy Susan and then it's covered over and turned and revealed either as if it didn't turn at all, which is impossible, or in where it would have turned to. And um, what happens is that the 13 to 14 month olds, that is not significant. But if it were significant, all it would tell you is that they look more at a novel view of the duck, which you must admit would be quite kind of boring. <laughs> um, the 15 to 16 month olds do look significantly more at the magic duck, the duck that it couldn't have been. And they do that whether or not it's the front view, because some reviewers said, you know, maybe the front view is special, or if they see an impossible side view, so that turned out not to matter. And then Andrea and Suhua did the same kind of action versus observation. Here's a toddler uh, being held by his mom and getting to interact. Now there's a turtle, not the duck, so you don't get experience with the duck, but you get experience with the turtle, and you can see the turtle moving with the lazy Susan and being in different orientations. Or you would really like to do that, but someone is showing it to you and it's out of your reach. So it's the same action versus observation, and what you see is the non-significant effect when nothing is happening, a significant effect, so now they can do it if they get to interact with the lazy Susan, but if you just observe somebody else doing the lazy Susan, no. So you've moved it on up the age range and again you see the importance of action with the objects. So one of the questions really is again, so we've tried to move up the age range and we've been saying, well, you know, what, what is it with the babies being so smart? But then when Andrea came to my lab, we tried to move down the age range. Like, couldn't we get these four-year-olds to do it? Maybe we could get three-year-olds to do it. So we tried two different approaches. One was a touch screen where it's kind of like a very simple form of Tetris. So you sit in your little infant seat and you look at the screen and there's these L-shaped figures and you just have to uh, look at the bottom left. You just have to touch either the left or the right for where that figure, if it were twisted, where could it fit in? So you don't have to exactly say anything, um, you just have to touch. That looks like it would simplify it, the kids seem to like it, but the four-year-olds are at chance. These are young four-year-olds, they can't do it. The five-year-olds are above chance. When you look at response time, the four-year-olds are flat, the five-year-olds are linear, albeit only linear in the middle, but they're linear. The error rates, the four-year-olds are flat. The five-year-olds are actually significant, significantly linear, although it looks shallow. And then we tried another thing. And this, I thought, was even jazzier. They, look at these ghosts. Aren't they cute? I really love these ghosts. And it's a puzzle, and you get to fit them into this puzzle board. And um, we also tried a paper version. Uh, the paper version is not more boring than the puzzle board. I thought the puzzle board would be more fun, but it, they're about the same. And there's different orientations, and some of them fit, and some of them don't. This time we tried three-year-olds being ever optimistic. They're totally a chance. These four-year-olds are older four-year-olds. They're above chance. The five-year-olds are even better. You put together, well, here's by orientation, but you put together the studies with the three-year-olds, the young four-year-olds with the touch screen, the older four-year-olds with the ghosts, the five-year-olds with the puzzle, uh, the touch screen, and what you see is basically until you're four and a half, you can't actively choose. 
So what I think is that at least by six months, I don't know what's going on with Johnson and Moore and um, with Quinn and Lib, and it may be, because I really think there's an important aspect here for manual exploration, and these kids are too young to grasp. So maybe their extrapolation and interpolation is important. But somewhere in infancy and toddlerhood, you can recognize a violation. If you're shown it, you look at it and you say, you yeah, know, that looks a little weird. Let me look at it just a little bit longer. That doesn't mean you think really that it's impossible, like we label these things impossible, but they don't think that's impossible, they just think it looks a little weird. That's all it takes to drive a looking time finding. But as you interact through grasping and crawling and so forth, that propels developmental change. But it does take years, until you're four and a half, before you can actively choose the right solution. So why does sensitivity shown in looking time take so long to inform active choice? This, I think, is really the puzzle for all of cognitive development, frankly. I mean, I think a lot of cognitive development needs to be rethought, not just mental rotation, but a lot of it, in light of these doubts about what looking time is telling us. So um, Andrea and Venke and I uh, think there are um, two possibilities. Um, this is uh, an article that I think will soon appear in a prestigious journal near you, although yesterday we were told that it was not exactly accepted. We had to change the figure caption and remove one reference, so I'm superstitious about telling you the journal. <laughs> but I think it will appear. So there's two possibilities. So look at the left. A lot of people talk about inverted U's in development, like babies are really, really smart, but then suddenly they kind of get a little dumb, but then something happens and they get smart again. These sound jazzy, they sound really interesting, but I don't understand them. Like what would lead to that sort of regression and development? What would account for that sort of two-year-olds being so dumb? No one has a theory of that. And in the absence of such a theory, then I think that can't be um, the answer. So if you look at the right, you see um, we, we, we've drawn it somewhat ambiguously. So what's in black is what we know, that there's some sort of competency in the babies. There's some kind of competency that's increasing from four on up. There's this terra incognita in between. Now, what's possibly true, because there's paradigm one and paradigm two, that is there's looking time and there's active choice, it might be that those two things are totally unrelated to each other, that they're just indexing really different competencies that Accidentally, we give them the same name, we're sort of using the same stimuli, but really they're unrelated. That, I think, is also, I mean, it's a little bit more probable in my mind than the one on the left, but I don't really think that's true. It sort of doesn't make much sense to me. What I think makes more sense is that what we're being told with looking time is a starting point, and this is what's taking me back to the theme of nativism and neoconstructivism. Babies are a lot smarter than tabula rasa. They can interpolate and extrapolate. That's not nothing. They can start to interact with the world and they can learn from those interactions. That's not nothing. That gets stronger and stronger as delay gets longer, as stimuli get more complex, as you know, those kinds of things happen. At some point, you get sure enough of the answer that you'll commit when you say, is it this one? or is it that one? Now, I do think that needs a lot of fleshing out, but that's an account of development that respects strong starting points, that says looking times are telling us it's something about infancy, but that doesn't say, look at those looking times, babies know everything. I think that is going way too far. So with that, I want to proceed to a um, briefer discussion of the second pillar of nativist thinking, which is the idea that the mind is modular. And what I uh, believe about this is not that bits of the brain aren't specialized. I think that would be crazy to uh, disbelieve. I think we do have neural specialization. But that there's neural specialization with a great deal of interchange among these brain areas, that they work cooperatively in interaction to achieve behavioral ends. And this has been played out in the spatial realm, mostly with respect to the debate about the geometric module. 
Now, let me note that in a lot of cognitive and developmental psychology, people have postulated a massive modularity. There's innate modules for language acquisition, for face processing, for theory of mind, for detecting cheaters, um, for many, many other things. And, um, you know, I, I, I could dispute that, but what I think is more important to confront is what I think is a more principled discussion of this kind, which is the core knowledge perspective, which has been proposed by Liz Spelke, for instance, with Katie Kinsler in a 2007 article, but in many other publications. And this is constrained to a few innate modules, one of which is geometry, and then there are others on object representation, number, actions, and social partners. So with respect to geometry, it's, uh, the debate has ranged uh, uh, over this uh, very, very specialized paradigm that was actually begun with rodents by Ken Cheng in the mid-80s. Uh, proceeded to be done with kids in uh, rectangular rooms in which you hide something in one of four corners. Uh, for rodents, it's food. For kids, it's toys. Uh, heaven for fen, they, they'd probably look for food too, but IRBs won't let you because, you know, they're always allergic to something, and besides, they might get too fat and all this kind of stuff. So you hide toys. And you spin them around so they can't egocentrically keep track of where they are, and they then select one of the four um, options. Now, in an all-white room that is just rectangular, the only thing that you have to guide your search is that it's the box where the long wall is to the left of the short wall, and there are two of those. So the rational child of the rational rodent would divide searches evenly between the correct and the rotation corner, and that's in fact what you find. And that's pretty interesting, because it means you can tell how long or how short the wall is, and our one is left and right of the other, and that's pretty good. But the module finding isn't that. The module finding is that when you make one of the walls colored, which should allow you to go right to the correct corner, kids don't, and neither do the rats. Now, you might be thinking, I would go to the right corner. What's wrong with them? And in fact, you would, or at least in this experiment, 96% of the time you would. I don't know what's up with the adults who 4% of the time go to the other corner, but <laughs> nobody's perfect. But human adults do largely uh, go to the correct corner. And the proposal has come uh, from uh, Spelke and in this publication with Herma Vasquez and Katz Nelson that it's language that accounts for this. Now, Note, I, I won't dispute this in detail, but note that if you're a nativist, you do have to explain developmental change because there is quite a lot of developmental change. So you only have a few options. One of them is biological maturation. You could always do that. You could appeal to an environment that's a trigger of some kind. You kind of turn on a light switch and some of your neural circuitry lights up at some point. That's an environmental input, but it's just like Okay, boom, I'm in this kind of language, um, something like that. And the third is that there's some sort of cultural teaching. So, um, uh, you know, language is a, un a sort of handy cultural package in this way. I think of it as kind of the forced marriage of Chomsky and Vygotsky, <laughs> um, because you just need something from the environment in order to sort of trigger something. Um, so that's been the proposal. So I'm only going to briefly um, tell you why I don't believe it in terms of the very initial findings, which are that I didn't tell you that uh, these experiments were done in very small rooms. They're four feet by six feet. This is about the size of, uh, if prisoners are kept in solitary confinement, this is about the size of their cell. Um, so we went to an eight by 12 foot room, which is the same proportion of long to short. It's quadruple the area. so. It's not large, though. It's kind of a small bedroom. It's just larger. Um, and what we find is that toddlers, 60% of the time, are picking the correct corner. Um, and uh, when Amy Learmonth went off to a postdoc with Lynn Nadell at Arizona, she redid it in a random assignment experiment where she found that in the small room, uh, the, these kids are four, they're evenly dividing between the correct and the reversal corner, but they do use features in the larger room. And in fact, even with adults, you can get this finding. With adults, you have to put, it, uh, put the features and the geometry in conflict. So you show them where things are hidden, you disorient them, you move the feature while their eyes are hidden and they're being disoriented. So now you have to say, 
Is it the geometry or is it the feature? You have to pick. Although a lot of adults are actually not aware of the conflict when you ask them afterwards. They just pick without thinking. Uh, but they do have to pick. And in the small room, adults go with geometry, 43% the correct, 38% the geometric error, which is obviously not significantly different, but they're going with the geometry. In the larger room, um, adults go with the feature. So there's something about the larger and the smaller room that pulls for one or the other to be trusted. Now, my argument about this is fundamentally, spatial cognition is about the larger rooms, not the smaller rooms, because spatial cognition evolved to help us find food, find our home, find our mates, avoid predators. This all happens in a larger environment. So basically, who cares about the four by six room? But this did engender um, a, a very spirited debate, which I won't go into. I'll just say that uh, there are some recent uh, references that you could go to to have a look at this. Uh, most recently, Ken Chang, Jane Ellen Huttenlocker, and I did a review uh, called 25 Years of Research on the Use of Geometry and Spatial Reorientation. It makes me a little tired to read 25 years of research, and it's still going strong, but you know, so you can read up on it. Or for those of you who are more kind of cyber oriented, you can go to the video of the plenary talk I gave at Psychonomics on this topic, or you can go to the video of the views by two debate that I had with Liz Spelke at SRCD on this topic. But in the time that remains, what I want to do is talk a little bit about neoconstructivism. I want to talk more sort of um, constructively about ways forward in development. So, and, and I want to do this in terms of certain tenets and appeal to certain famous people who I think pointed the way uh, forward here. And first of all, I'm showing Charles Darwin, and I want to say that everyone is a Darwinist. I think sometimes nativists um, try to mantle themselves in I'm Darwinian, I believe in evolution, I take biology seriously, you don't. You know, you're a tabula rasa person. But I don't think anyone is really a tabula rasa person, not anymore. I think all theorizing in contemporary cognitive development is situated in a context in which we all take Darwin very seriously. So I just want to say, no one has the Darwinian high ground. I also want to invoke Bill Greeno because I think that experience expectancy, which is a term that he introduced, is really key here. Because using this concept, we can see how these strong starting points, which I think are really there, are important and are important in a Darwinian context. So if you're mother evolution, you don't have to strongly representationally build in things that you know that the human mind will be able to build when interacting with the physical world as it always has existed. Why bother if you're mother nature? If you're going to get that objects are solid, that there's gravity, you know, the odds of the kid being born in space are not high. So you can just do it this way. And so there's no a priori need for specific content, or at least for a lot of, there might be some, but there's no a priori need for a lot of specific content to be wired in. This is an empirical question, obviously, but there's no a priori need. Now we get to um, the Gibsons, and I'm not a Gibsonian. I'm not any, I mean, I guess I am a Darwinian, but I, I, I think that we've gone too far in a lot of psychology and just sort of belonging to certain uh, religions. Uh, but the Gibsons did have really important insights here, and here the insight, and this goes very much, I think, with the Greeno experience expectancy concept, is that the world is very well equipped with perceptual redundancies and correlations that, can ex uh, th that support this kind of experience expectant learning. Um, so I don't know about the information being picked up. I'm not quite sure what that means, but I think that it can be actively constructed. And what's important is that you can actively construct things better when you have these kinds of redundancies and correlations. Here's the Reverend Bayes. Um, you might or might not be a Bayesian. You could be a Bayesian and be a nativist, as uh, Josh Tenenbaum, I guess, says he is. Um, but I think this is a part of uh, what I think of as a contemporary neoconstructivism. 
One thing we do know humans have is impressive capacities for statistical learning and for Bayesian thinking. And um, this is one of the approaches that I've been trying to develop and I'm still developing for the geometric module debate. Uh, but it is possible to think about how you construct the world uh, based on this capacity for Bayesian and statistical learning. This is Liz Bates, um, who died much too young, uh, but who together with Jeff Elman and Mark Johnson and Annette Karmeloff Smith wrote a wonderful book um, called Rethinking Nativism. And a very memorable phrase from that book for me is interactions all the way down. So the idea here is what I've been developing, that this richly structured world and this strong capacity for probabilistic reason interact within this experience expectancy framework to allow you to select among, to integrate the multiple cues that are typically available to draw conclusions, whether it's about causality, memory for spatial location, or whatever. And Piaget, the importance of action. I stress that very much when I talked about mental rotation. I think that action creates the occasion for experimentation, for often playful situations in which you get more information than you ever would from simple observation. That can be physical action, and that's what I stress for mental rotation. But it can also be cognitive, quote unquote, action. Um, Piagetian theory is fundamentally dissonance reduction theory from social psychology. You want the world to make sense. Like, it can't be this and this. Like, this is wrong. Or maybe I could merge them somehow. But you're really actively striving to, to make sense. And I think that is one of the fundamental insights that Piaget brought us. This is Shep White. When I talked last night, I uh, Remember Jerry Kagan, who uh, taught me much, but in this context, I want to remember Shep, who brought together in my mind the themes of development and the themes of learning, which are often strongly distinguished, but I think they're not as distinct as some people have thought they are. Basically, development is learning, but it's learning as the learner changes. So a problem with traditional learning theory was that you didn't think about the learner changing. So we have perceptual tuning in the first year of life as Janet Verker and others have, stu have studied. We have formation of the shape bias as Linda Smith has uh, studied. We have examples where the learner changes and then learning changes. So that's important, but it's still learning. This is Esther Thielen, another person who died too young. And a very memorable uh, phrase from the Smith and Thielen book for me is the view from above and the view from below. One of the sort of dichotomies in the traditional intro to developmental psych world is stages versus quantitative development. And Thielen and Smith showed us that it's really both, that if you stand way back, <laughs> away from the microphone so you can't hear me, um, the, uh, the baby is really different from the adult. They're really, really different. That's a qualitative difference. But you can also look at those little increments, like the 13-month is a little different from the 16-month-old and whether or not you have to turn the lazy Susan or not. And that's kind of quantitative. So it's really both. And uh, last, there's Aristotle. He's definitely dead. <laughs> In fact, I had to find a picture of him as a marble statue. Uh, but um, he, I think, taught us, taught me, that there's different kinds of causation. We're always talking about what causes development. There's formal causation, which is really what, um, actually this is a phrase from um, anthropology, from Clifford Geertz, um, thick description. The thicker the description, the more you understand about development in a certain way. It's not all that you need, but it's a very, very important part of what you need. Developmental psychology is in some ways fundamentally a descriptive science. Yes, I know we can do experiments, but we can't manipulate our key variable, which is age. So we need to do thick description. There's also material causation, which is the neural substrate, which I think is really fascinating. It's more difficult to study in development, and this is where we often need non-human animal models, but you can't have that for everything because humans can do some things that they can't. There's the final causation, which is the evolutionary context, the Darwinian context. 
And there's the efficient causation, which is the analysis of those interactions of environmental input with the neural substrate and with the current cognitive state of the learner. Now, there are family disagreements in neoconstructivism. Some people are more domain general. Some people like domain specificity. I'm a little more on the domain specificity myse uh, myself, but a little dash of domain generality for things like working memory. Some people are a little bit more top down. Some people a little more bottom up. I'm really much more on the top down side there, not disregarding some bottom up, but more top down. Crucially, some people believe in representations. Some people, like dynamic systems theorists, do not. Here I'm unequivocally on the side of representations, so I think that's a pretty important family disagreement. And Last, I just want to say, well, why does the nativist empiricist debate persist? Couldn't we get rid of it? In fact, this is the standard line in intro textbooks. They say, oh, well, that's a thing of the past, <laughs> except it's not. We keep fighting it. So only, I, you know, I wish they were correct, but they seem not to be. I think there's some problems. I think people are more interested in things inside the person than outside the person. Like, you can't say, oh, scientific discovery, I'm sending to science, there is gravity. <laughs> I mean, there's gravity, that's not a discovery. But if the baby knows gravity, somehow that's a discovery. Some people are just more interested in starting points, and I do think starting points are fascinating. I just think there's also change. Ultimately, though, and I sort of alluded to this when I talked about being a Gibsonian or a anything Ian and not, you know, really believing in religion, I really think that we do too much religiosity here, that these questions are empirical. And if we could really commit to them being empirical, we could maybe um, get beyond the debate. So I have managed to finish with four minutes for questions, which I really wanted to do, and I thank you. Yeah, Hi, Nora. Tom. Congratulations. Oh, thank <laughs> it was you. really great. Um, I'm curious about the relationship between uh, motor experience and action and the development of these mental spatial capacities. Um, Specifically, I wonder about the relationship between um, locomotor activity and manual exploration, whether there's, they are part and parcel of some underlying like single motor experience kind of thing, or they, they happen to be correlated, but they operate differently and make different kinds of contributions. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if you're maybe asking me as, a, this is potentially um, an empirical question in the sense of um, some people have done things like when babies are in walkers and you free up their hands and they can do more with their hands. I believe the answer is going to be that it's not just correlated, that it's causal. Uh, but I think you can't yet make a slam dunk case for that. Is that what you wanted to know? or? Right. Right. I think that the fact that you do sometimes get motor cortex uh, being active even when adults do this is very telling. Um, I think that mental rotation is ultimately built off of manual rotation and that we see ghosts of that in adults, that they've learned to do it without that, but that it's built on that. That's partly why I think that there is some evidence that that is unique uh, to Homo sapiens. Lots of spatial stuff is not unique to Homo sapiens, but it's been very difficult to get evidence of mental rotation in non-human animals. And I think that upright gait and hands are very, very key to that. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Barbara. Hi. Um, I wanted to comment first that I think that the whole field and what you're talking about are still struggling with Piaget's unanswered question about how does vertical decollage happen? That yeah. there's stuff different from infancy to middle childhood and on, and he just said, well, it was some kind of friction in the task. Yeah. Well, you've got paradigm one and paradigm two that you were talking about. And I wanted to ask you about another way to interpret what's happening in paradigm two. Not just, well, I think in all of the tasks that you mentioned, and maybe in all tasks that anyone can imagine, what we're asking three and four-year-olds to do is to do something we're telling them to do. 
And Luria is, early on said, well, they have a really hard time inhibiting some other way of mm -hmm. acting. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're just being asked to do too much at once. And mm -hmm. so having those responses required of them by somebody else. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where I think we could get into maybe an experimental way of looking at this. Yeah. If we could find some way that their own ways of doing things without being told what to do uh -huh. would, be, would tell us about Right. spatial rotation, that might be able to differentiate some of this. So I think two things about this. One is Andrea Frick has a, a longitudinal uh, project uh, in Switzerland that she's just sort of as we speak finishing gathering the last data points for. But one of the things that she did do was to give some executive function tasks uh, together with these. And she is finding some correlations between your ability as a pre, uh, not preschooler, I think kindergartner, to inhibit and your ability to do mental rotation. So some of that damping that you're talking about correlationally may be involved. What I think is more telling is actually research that I didn't mention by Claes von Hofsten and his collaborators that is with toddlers. So they're the two-year-olds in the middle. And this is actually why I have this picture of the kid rolling the circle around with the shape sorter. Because this is something kids actually do want to do and they do on their own. And what you observe is that initially they, they don't do it very well and they experiment with it. And there's even some really microgenetic, very fine-tuned kind of stuff about first they just get it to the right hole and then they rotate like dumbly until it clicks and they do it a little bit more in anticipation, a little bit more in anticipation. So I think you can actually see self-propelled learning through those toddler years in those studies. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Okay, I think I'm out of time. So thank you all.